Another local mountain lion killed, but this time it was planned. The controversial policy that led to the big cat's death. After days of howling winds, the weather is taking a break. But the big change in store for Valentine's Day. And it's a major side street to PCH. The plans to make this road safer for people and wildlife. News at 5 starts now. Weather and sports. Live from Malibu, this is Newswave 32. For the first time in the Santa Monica Mountains, authorities approve the killing of a local mountain lion. Good evening, I'm Josie Leonetti. And I'm Savannah Welch. Welcome to the Tuesday night edition of Newswaves. In our top story tonight, state wildlife agencies authorized the death of a mountain lion that lived in the Santa Monica Mountains. Newswaves reporter Jenna Ray Gartner joins us live in the Santa Monica Mountains with more details. Jenna? Thank you. Yes, a mountain lion was legally killed under depredation law two weeks ago in the Santa Monica Mountains. This was after a landowner complained that P-56 had been killing livestock on his property. This is one of two male mountain lions that's in the Santa Monica area, sparking concern across Southern California. The first radio collared mountain lion to be killed legally passed away near Camarillo on January 27th. Although mountain lion hunting has been banned since 1990, this case fell under state depredation law. P-56 was a four or five year old male and was the first radio collared study animal to be killed. He was part of the National Park's mountain lion study and was living in the northwestern Santa Monica Mountains. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife issued a depredation permit to a landowner after P-56 killed 12 animals during nine different incidents. Tim Daly, the public information officer for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, told me that depredation permits allow landowners to capture and euthanize animals only if they have already tried to deter them in non-lethal ways. People who are working in fish and wildlife have, have this occupation because they enjoy fish and wildlife, the great outdoors, nature, preserving wildlife. And so when an animal shows this kind of behavior and has to be um, you know, removed from a, a location, euthanized, it's, 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 it's very disappointing. It's very unfortunate. In this case, the landowner had tried other precautions such as penning in livestock, using trained guard dogs, special fencing and motion activated lights and noises. When none of the non-lethal measures proved successful, the landowner was able to obtain the depredation permit. Ana Cholo, spokesperson for the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, claimed that this lion was one of two males of reproducing age in the Santa Monica Mountains. More importantly, he was um, a breeding male and a huge contributor to you know, diversifying the gene pool here. Tim also told me that this is not the first time a mountain lion has been killed through depredation law. However, because it was the first radio collared mountain lion to be killed by this policy, it has gained much more recognition. Once again, it's unfortunate. Nobody, nobody wishes at the start of the day that that's what they were going to have to do, but there are just some cases when the animal behavior is this serious that it does have to happen. Although most mountain lions are covered by a three-strike policy, Anacholo informed me that P-56 was actually outside of the geographical location that the policy covers. She also told me that he had gone above and beyond the three-strike policy with almost nine incidents in which he killed livestock. Reporting from the Santa Monica Mountains, I'm Jenna Gartner, Newswaves 32. Thank you, Jenna. The fierce winds that have been blasting Malibu are dying down as we head into the evening. Winds are currently blowing at 10 miles an hour with gusts up to 14 miles per hour. Winds will calm down tonight to 5 to 10 miles per hour. The wind advisory originally in place until 9 p.m. tonight expired earlier at 3. The blistering winds that blew through Malibu overnight were some of the highest recorded speeds in L.A. County today. Winds in Escondido Canyon reached 71 miles per hour this morning, and the Malibu Hills area reached 54 miles per hour. New video has been released of the fatal helicopter crash that killed NBA star Kobe Bryant and eight others in Calabasas. Local biker Michael Dyer captured this video when he heard and saw the moment the chopper went down on January 26th. Dyer said he was just a few feet away on a bike trail and captured the smoke and flames coming from the scattered debris. 
The National Transportation Safety Board has not released its final report, but investigators believe poor weather conditions and pilot error are likely causes of the crash. A public memorial is scheduled for Bryant and his daughter Gianna at the Staples Center in two weeks. Authorities are asking for the public's help to find a missing woman. The LA County Sheriff's Department says Julia Christine Snyder has been missing since last Saturday night. She was last seen near her Malibu home in the 4300 block of Ocean View Drive near Latigo Canyon. She is described as 5 foot 7 and 140 pounds with long straight blonde hair and blue eyes. Anyone with information is encouraged to contact Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at 323-890 5500. Major changes are coming to a busy road in the heart of Malibu. News Ace 32 reporter Hannah Fullman is live at Civic Center Way with details on what the city is doing to increase safety here. Hannah? Malibu City Council voted last night to enhance and revamp new safety features along Civic Center Way. New changes are coming to Civic Center Way. The City Council approved several new changes to the popular road as part of a major improvement project. The project goal is to improve all modes of transportation on Civic Center Way. That's to improve safety, improve pedestrian and bicycle facilities on Civic Center Way. The first addition to Civic Center Way is adding a safety fence from Webb Way to the Malibu Canyon condominiums. The fence material will be composed of vinyl material and have a 15 inch gap allowing wildlife to safely pass through. The material will be more protective for environmentally sensitive areas and be more preventative against wildfires. There's a law on, there's an LIP section on how you have to have wildlife permeable fences next to Eshes. And this is next to what's before the city council right now. I mean, before the Coastal Commission on disturbing a wetland. To make the road safer at night, the council agreed to relocate a major streetlight to better brighten the road and prevent more accidents. The streetlight will be located across from the Malibu Canyon condominiums and further enhanced with dark sky compliant features, reducing levels of pollution. My sense from working with the, the lighting ordinance so far is that the warmer temperatures, the warmer colors are less um, problematic as far as wildlife. And Finally, to use new sidewalk material that will be safer for pedestrians and have a more appealing look. It looks like a gravel surface and it's able to wear better. It meets the requirement uh, um, for ADA. Um, it's After these improvements are made, the city wants to add new bike lanes, more street lights, and reduce the speed limit from 40 miles per hour to 35. This is Hannah Fullman, News Waves 32. Thank you, Hannah. The city is no longer installing new security features at the Point Doom Headlands Nature Preserve. The plan to add a new gate and traffic spikes at the preserve's parking was scrapped after the city announced that they do not have the resources needed to move forward with the project. Efforts are underway to divide Malibu into separate voting districts. Last night, the city council heard their first public hearing about electing council members based on districts. This comes after Malibu lawyer Kevin Shakeman sent a letter to the council claiming the city's at-large voting system prevents Latinos in the city to influence elections. Community members at the meeting were concerned about how dividing up districts would be conducted. Maybe you want Big Rock area to have a representative and you want the West to have a representative. Maybe that makes sense. But if, if, if you think that makes sense, that clearly tells you how to, how to propose a division. But if you don't think this is a good idea and you're just doing it because you've been threatened with a lawsuit, that's not a good reason to be doing it. And it's especially not a good reason to be doing it the wrong way. Some speakers suggested alternative ways of dividing districts to more accurately fit the unique socioeconomic nature of Malibu. Whatever might be causing the most disenfranchisement, whatever that might be, because whatever it is, the numbers say that uh, this, in this unique town, it's not race. The next public hearing to gather community input on district elections is March 5th. The city will make a decision in April about whether to put the voting changes on the November 2020 ballot. Calabasas leaders are cracking down on vapes and e-cigarettes. 
The Calabasas City Council is discussing a potential ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products and e-cigarette devices. Currently, Calabasas permits the sale of tobacco products of at least 500 feet away from schools. The council will discuss whether to completely ban all electronic cigarette devices or adopt a partial ban that prohibits the sale of flavored tobacco products. The meeting starts tomorrow at 7 p.m. Well, it has certainly made being outside unpleasant and even dangerous. Oh, my goodness, this wind has been so insane. So insane. So insane. I was telling some friends earlier that on my way to school this morning, I ran over a tumbleweed and it got stuck in my car. Oh my gosh. And I drove all the way up the hill with this tumbleweed in my <laughs> car. I probably looked so dumb, but I got it out, thankfully. Thankfully, but this wind yeah. has just been so bad. Oh my gosh, it just so it ruins everything, honestly. I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not either. I'm well, not coming up, another after another morning and afternoon of blasting winds, things are returning to normal for now. The big weather change coming for Valentine's Day. Plus, Malibu taking on the challenge of homelessness. How le city leaders hope to be a hope and model when it comes to addressing the problem at hand. And calling a major error. Why some say the tennis team at a local high school was chosen based on talent. Welcome back. Amid California's homeless crisis, the city of Malibu is taking on the issue. News 32 reporter Brianna Willis met with the mayor this morning to hear about the city's first steps and what could serve as a model for other cities. Bree? Yes, Josie, that's right. This morning I sat down with Malibu Mayor Karen Farrer and Mayor Pro Tem Mikey Pearson to discuss the next steps in battling the problem of homelessness in Malibu. They have officially applied to be part of the 100-day challenge. Take a look. We have a humanitarian crisis in our own world-famous, celebrity-studded town at the beach. The city of Malibu, taking on homelessness one step at a time. We want to be a model city for a small city in dealing with this, so this is our start. Last night at the city council meeting, the council unanimously voted to move forward with the 100-day challenge to combat homelessness. All in favor? Aye. 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 The challenge is a state initiative run by Rapid Results Institute that urged cities to find a unique goal to end homelessness. It's a way for us to look for innovative solutions to, you know, obviously a growing issue, not just in Malibu, but all over the country. Mayor Fair and Mayor Pro Tem Pearson already have two plans in place that they think will be achievable for the city. First is the safe parking program. Literally, the parking lot and again, we don't know where it's going to be located right now. Our parking area is locked between approximately 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. And at 6, maybe 6.30 a.m., those vehicles are required to vacate. And the second plan is to provide a homeless shelter at the vacant courthouse near Malibu Library. The city has officially applied to be part of the challenge, but whether or not they are accepted, they still plan on taking action. It's not to me so much even a homeless issue as it's a community issue. We're a community and we have to deal with everybody here fairly and compassionately. If accepted, the 100-day challenge will have no fiscal impact on the city of Malibu. And the mayor and Mayor Pro Tem Pearson told me this morning that they are visiting Laguna Beach tomorrow because that's actually one of the cities that was sued for not having a homeless shelter. And now they have one. They also told me that if the city is accepted into this program, it would actually take 195 days and not 100 days. So Jenna and Josie Savannah, and it just looks like it's a name. Yeah, well, I mean, regardless of 100 or 195, I'm glad they're doing something that, you know, is a little bit more substantial. Yeah. You know, they've, had, they've made efforts before. They had the, the, the clean out of Legacy Park. Right. Um, but oh, it's definitely. been an ongoing problem, you know, throughout really the has, years. It really is a community issue, and I think that's something that, you know, we forget about, and there are so many misconceptions right. about homeless issues, so Absolutely. it's really good to have kind of that basis and be able to reach out in the community and make it a community effort and trying to improve that situation. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, definitely. Well, the strong winds have finally died down and all of the advisories have been lifted. Now we get to enjoy a few days of warm weather. It is currently sunny with the temperature at 64 degrees. Wind speeds are much lower than earlier today at 14 miles per hour. Humidity is currently at 36%. And thanks to the winds tonight will be mostly clear with a low around 655 and north winds of just 5 to 10 miles per hour. Let's take a look at our regional temperatures map. It's warm all around and nice now that the winds have cut back. In Santa Monica right now, the temperature is 68. 
In Thousand Oaks, it is 69 degrees and sunny. And in Calabasas and Agora Hills, it is 66 degrees with clear skies. Today's fire threat is moderate, but is expected to drop to very low this evening. The winds wrecked the surf. Waves were only at 1 to 2 feet today with the water temperature between 56 and 58 degrees. And looking at your four day forecast, tomorrow will continue to be sunny and, and nice, but a bit colder with a high of 62 degrees and a low of 49. Thursday will be cloudy with a high of 63 and a low of 48. Friday for Valentine's Day, more clouds will roll in. There is a 10% chance of rain. The high will be 64 with a low of 52. Saturday will be sunny again with a high of 65 and a low of 52. Well, another sign of recovery post Woolsey. This past weekend, Grape Arbor Park in Calabasas celebrated its grand reopening. This event included music, hot dogs, and games. The park was destroyed during the 2018 Woolsey fire. Since then, the community members have come together to help rebuild it. The park is now open to the public. Webster Elementary is mourning the loss of one of its own. Last Thursday, former Webster principal Phil Cott passed away after undergoing cancer treatment for a decade. Cott served as the Webster principal from 1990 till his retirement in 2013. Plans are being made for a celebration of Cott's life. The date for that memorial is still to be determined. Cott was 68 years old. And it's not the kind of advantage you want in tennis. Santa Monica High School parents are claiming the school's tennis coach favors certain players. Newswave's 32 reporter Kai Yu Wong has more on the parents' push for fairer tryouts. Parents are calling on the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District to stop coaches from giving unfair advantages to certain student athletes. Samo High boys and girls JV tennis teams are pay for play. Parents are claiming Santa Monica High School tennis coach Wilston Poon favors students who pay him for private lessons, giving them spots over other players during the team's tryouts last fall. Coach Poon told us that six out of the seven freshman boys accepted on the team had been paying him for private lessons and or clinics. The fact that Coach Poon is subjectively evaluating kids who are paying him privately is a conflict of interest. Parents say the students who made the boys tennis team had less experience than those who didn't. Some student athletes who paid Coach Poon for lessons and made the team had been playing tennis for less than six months, had never played competitive matches, and were ranked below kids who didn't make the team. Laura Ford said she first heard about Poon by calling other parents after her son didn't make the team. What kept coming back was they had done private or clinics with Coach Poon. Ford said she met with Santa Monica High School's administrators to discuss her concerns. And they said, you can't tell us how to run, you know, a parent can't come in and tell us how to run our athletic program. After failed attempts to get Santa Monica High to take action, Ford and other parents called on the school board last Thursday to crack down on the way coaches choose their teams. Coach Wilston Poon runs a private tennis business using Samo High facilities. Overhaul the tryout system and safeguard it against any conflict of interest. School board members, you are the watchdogs of our district. Time is of the essence. The school board is now asking SMM USD Superintendent Ben Dratty to send reports about what the district is doing to address concerns. Santa Monica High School and the district cannot be reached for comment. Kai Wong, News Ace 32. And new developments in the case against an actor accused of faking a hate crime. Plus, bringing people together through dance. A highly anticipated annual show returns to Pepperdine this week. And no matter who you're spending it with, the deals for Valentine's Day we can all love. The happiest place on earth just became the most expensive place on earth. Well, not literally, but today Disneyland Park tickets raise prices, pushing the cost of some one-day passes above $200. Prices of annual passes and the digital max pass climbed too. One-day park hopper tickets rose $5 to $159 from $154 for lowest demand days and to $209 from $199 for highest demand days. The spike in cost comes just months after the park opened its biggest expansion in history. 
That's pretty upsetting, That's if you ask me. so expensive. Not surprising. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not surprising. I was just there a few weeks ago, and it was great. But it is, it might be the, called the most expensive place on Earth. That <laughs> especially now. That makes a lot of sense, especially with Star Wars land and everything. It's yeah. just so, so high. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, we have some more updates on the Jesse Smollett case, which was ongoing um, around a year ago, and mm -hmm. he's now been faced with charges. Yes, so what is. more can you tell us about that, race? Well, Jesse Smollett is facing six new charges for allegedly staging and lying about a hate attack on himself. The former Empire actor was indicted by a grand jury in Illinois on six accounts of disorderly conduct today. Smollett claimed he was attacked by two racist, homophobic men last year, but later confirmed that he staged the attack. The special prosecutor in charge of the case says further prosecution of Smollett is in the interest of justice. Pepperdine dancers are ready to spread their wings and fly in the 2020 Dance in Flight show. Darcy Hill is one of the dancers and choreographers of the show. She hopes viewers will take in the artistry of the performance. We're not just dancing, but we're like creating something and we're creating a message. And I think it'd be cool for people to get that out of the show. This year's Dance and Flight theme is What Do You Feel? And the show will take its audience through varying emotions. The performance will begin with a dance resembling a feeling of loneliness and end with the dance mirroring a sense of togetherness. Performances will begin 8 p.m. this Thursday and will continue through Saturday. Tickets for the show are priced at $20 and are available on the Arts website online. It's the story Malibu cannot forget. The 2020 Malibu International Film Festival is this Saturday and will feature a documentary about the Woolsey Fire. 13 movies will be available to screen at the festival this year. One tells the story of the people and the response to the Woolsey Fire. The festival will take place from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the Malibu City Hall. There will also be a filmmaker reception from 7 to 10 Saturday night. Ticket prices range from $15 to $500, depending on the amount of movies you want to screen. Oscar winner Parasite is currently in the works to becoming a TV series. Parasite made history at the Oscars for becoming the first foreign language film to win Best Picture. After the movie's success at the ceremony, director Bong Joon-ho is reportedly working with HBO to make a limited TV series. You know, I'm really sad to admit that I have not seen Parasite yet. Have you seen you it? You really should. It's really good. I want to see it so bad, and I'm so determined, so determined to see it. I just need to, like, sit and just and watch it and... I mean, oh, it's, I it's, it's apparently it's the, obviously it's the best film of the year. 